Sanye cıda zorge çoğunam da çancı pardu da ne ikap suç. Da gecin zorge be çoğunam ki dola pengir sanye rubara eşu. Sanye cıda zorge çoğunam da çancı pardu da ne ikap suç. Da gecin zorge be çoğunam ki dola pengir sanye rubara eşu. Om ye dharma he to prabhavam he tum te jandata gato yavatat te sham chayo niroda evam vati mahashramana yesvaha Om ye dharma he to prabhavam he tum te shanda tha gato yavatat te sham chayo niroda evam vati mahashramana he svaha Om ye dharma he to prabhavam he tum te sham da tha gato yavatat te sham chayo niroda evam vati mahashramana yesvaha all phenomena arise from causes. The causes, the succession of causes, as well as taught by the great seer. Okay. Um, as we recite this mantra, uh, particularly Om Ye Dharma Hetu Prabhava Hetum Tesham Tathagato Hyavatat. The causes are taught by the Tathagata. When we recite this part, we should be able to think of how self grasping ignorance, projecting things is real. How that is responsible for all our miseries. This is what we need to think of. Then alongside we can think of the inappropriate attention, gross afflictions, contaminant karmas, well and good. But the self-grasping ignorance, that is a root that must come to our mind. If that comes to you, your the Dharma understanding is really very good. Otherwise, say that all oh, your problems are because of contaminant karmas, your negative karmas, and karmas are because of the afflictions. That is the um, uh, that's the understanding which is quite normal, but uh, the somebody who is the exposed to the the Buddhist philosophy teachings to understand the the mechanism of suffering so well, you should be able to identify the self grasping ignorance as the root of all the miseries. Okay, so of course, meanwhile, we need to take care of the other causes as well, and then when you say. Desham chayu niruta, desham chayu niruta. Cessation of these causes, causes, as well as taught by the great seer. The cessation of these causes, when you recite this, and the emptiness, experience of emptiness should come to you. And whatever little experience of emptiness that you have, you try to recall that experience of emptiness at that point. Okay, the cessation, to bring an end to these causes and the miseries. When in the experience, in light of the experience with emptiness, in the experience of emptiness, all these miseries dissolve, all the causes of the miseries dissolve. This is what should come to your mind. And then this mantra will become very powerful. You can feel it. It's very powerful. Okay. Now we're going to read uh, from page 213, given that the, um, say the, uh, some form of introduction to emptiness is done. We read from page 213. This is the collection, the compendium or compilation of the, uh, say, the, some important passages which His Holiness, His Holiness the Dalai Lama uses during his teachings. And uh, this is particularly what I've been gathering. And the whole book is actually like that. The whole book, how this, came, uh, how this book came to be, and was that the, when I was translating for His Holiness, his students used to give lots of teachings on, on the, sh the very important but short texts. And me as a translator, my job is to gather these materials in English. And I 
the output effort. Some of them I translated myself where I don't find the translations. So this is how this book came into being in 2000, I think like 10 or 11. So it was not this big. It's the, uh, the we get it. Then, and then later on, the over the years, I've been the I say, what do I find important? Um, the over the the span of time, the then I added them. I keep adding them, and <clears throat> even this compilation, what we have here in this compilation, we see that there are many passages which I added later. Okay, so we're going to read this, and then where. Um, where necessary, I will also do a little bit of explanations here and there. This is the all related to emptiness. Are you ready? <clears throat> the first one, I'm quickly going to explain the first one. Um, and then from your, from your side, just see, so what is the, the core message of this, uh, the, the first passage? Is that the Bodhisattva is comparing the two Bodhisattvas. The Bodhisattva, who generated bodhicitta for the last many lifetimes, our first bodhisattva, but lacking in the skill and means. Skill and means here referring to the wisdom of emptiness. So this bodhisattva generated bodhicitta, but <clears throat> did not have the, the wisdom of emptiness and generated bodhicitta for the last many, many, many lifetimes. Then on the other hand, there is um, the bodhisattva who newly generated bodhicitta. Who freshly became Bodhisattva, but uh, the second Bodhisattva is endowed with the wisdom of emptiness. So Bodhisattva is comparing the two Bodhisattvas by returning to it to the accumulation of merit. So Bodhisattva is um, the uh, saying that the Bodhisattva, although you have just freshly or you have newly become a Bodhisattva, but if you are say the virtues are complemented by the wisdom of emptiness, that, that, that merit far excels the, the whatever number of the merit, what, that amount of merit that one has accumulated um, as a Bodhisattva, but without the wisdom of emptiness for the last many, many, many lifetimes. So the core message with this is that if you are, the, say the virtues are complemented by the wisdom of emptiness, then your virtue becomes extremely intense powerful and uh, the, um, the very expansive. So the key lies, for example, is like somebody with a proper education on engineering, engineering and then become a very sophisticated, the, the one of the leading engineers in the world versus somebody who is just an ordinary mechanic, ordinary mechanic, this person works so hard for like 10 hours every day and at the end of the, the month, you get, let's say, like $200, that's it. Whereas the, the other, the leading engineer in the world, he or she just puts a signature and millions of dollars, billions of dollars turnover happens. So it's because of the, uh, what's the difference? Where lies the difference? The one with the intelligence. Where the intelligence is there, then whatever you do can become extremely effective and efficient. So this is where, this is what the Bodhisattva Shagman is teaching us, in, in a way indicating or advising us that uh, your virtues must be complemented by the wisdom of emptiness. Okay, let's read this. Gift of Youth, Ratna Sutra. <clears throat> Manjushri, whoever listens even with doubt to this teaching on emptiness, generates much greater merit than the Bodhisattva, who, lacking skill and means, practices the six professions for a hundred thousand eons. This being so, what need is there to say anything about a person who listens to this teaching without doubt? What need is there to say anything about a person who in past the scripture and writing, memorizes it, and also teaches it thoroughly and extensively to others? The treasure of the one does gone sutra. Any person who possesses all these ten great non-virtues enters into the teaching of the selflessness and has faith and conviction that all phenomena are from the beginning pure of true existence, does not go to a bad rebirth. Chapter on Subduing Devil Sutra. If any bhikshu realizes that all phenomena are absolutely pacified of inherent existence and at the beginning of the and the beginning of the defilements is devoid of self nature, he'll remove the guilt of having defilements and make unstable the defilements, 
thus deeming even the immeasurable negativity is dysfunctional, let alone the secondary wrongs done associated with the ethics and rituals. Are there was 400, 400 verses on the middle way? Those with less merit will not even have a doubt in this Dharma of ultimate reality. Should any doubt, inquiry ever arise in someone, it will shatter samsara into pieces. Ajara Dharma Gita is coming to a valid commission. One is liberated through the view of emptiness. The rest of the meditations are for the sake of that. Bodhisattva Shanti Devas guided the Bodhisattva's way of life. All of these branches of practices were taught by the Buddha for the sake of wisdom. Therefore, those who wish to pacify suffering should generate this wisdom. Ajara Chandra Gita is entering the middle way. Even as an ordinary being, when hearing about emptiness, if one experiences with an utter joy again and again, tears flowing from such a pure joy moisten one's eyes, and one's hand stares on end, one has the seed of the profession of full awakening. Upalitika Sutra, the various delightful flowers blossom, and sparkling supreme golden apples stand so alluring. For none of these is their creator, they are posited by the power of thought, it is through the conceptualization that the world is imputed. Okay, this verse, in fact, I personally, on the, all my personal practices on emptiness, particularly on emptiness, meditating emptiness. So usually you have to keep these things as confidential, not to disclose, oh, I'm meditating emptiness, I'm meditating bodhicitta. These are to be maintained confidential. But for you, why I'm sharing this is to tell you that there's something to be done, not just you study it and then the, um, the leave it there. So once you study this, keep studying, ex the, the engage in extensive studies, reflect on this, have discussions with other people, and whatever little understanding that you get, the see how to put it into practice. So this is why I'm sharing with otherwise, if you're all my like classmates or my seniors, I will not talk about this at all, what I'm doing. This is my, my own business. And it is advised not to disclose what you're doing, pretend you don't practice. So sometimes we become, you know, the say what you do just it make it very public that I practice this, I have this, this, this yoga tantra has yoga tantra empowerments, at these satanas, you know, just publicize. This is totally uh, unwise. It says that if you make these things public. And the, your spiritual realizations, your growth is going to be hampered greatly because suddenly the ego arises within you that I'm doing something, the ego arises. The ego is the one which stops the growth of your spiritual realizations. So it hampers you. So therefore what you do is to be kept confidential. Of course, to your teachers, you have to be very transparent. These are what the, the, the things that I'm doing. Just tell me, you know, advise me the, whether what I'm doing is correct, not correct, to add, delete, whatever. Um, you have to be transparent to your teachers. But otherwise, you know, the same for other people. You know, what practice do you do? What is your main deity? You know, who's your root guru? This is all just nonsense. And if somebody asks you like this, this is all nonsense. And if you they publicize this, you are nonsense. So therefore, it's so important to keep these things confidential. And then why? I'm doing so, you say, the, in the early days, of course, I never talked about these things. But nowadays, I realize that. So in the early days, when I teach, most of the, the attendees, I, must, I myself must be in my 20s or 30s. And the participants, they are like 30s, 40s, older than me. So I don't really have to say anything. But now I realize that most of them, they're younger than me. I'm the oldest one. This is what I sense nowadays. So therefore, the thing is just to tell you that there's something to be practiced. So therefore, I'm sharing this. This verse, in Tibetan it is, Naswa Yigan, and this one, the various delightful flowers will blossom. So what did we learn? It's not just don't wait for somebody to tell you that this verse is this, you have to apply this in your meditation. No. So as you read these, well, for example, this book, the whole book is, so, is a treasure. It's a huge, big treasure that the people who are into Dharma for so long, particularly the English speakers, who have to rely on English. When they see the books in the early versions, like the, the, the version 10 years ago, so those versions, which is very rudimentary, very simple, even those books, some of the people who depend on English for their Dharma practice, 
They say that this is a real treasure for we have never seen such a book. So this is exactly what I've been the looking for and now I found it. This is many people they comment like this. So this now this is have this has taken a good shape. There's so many hands were involved in this. Okay. So the, wherever you find some very important stanzas related to bodhicitta, related to emptiness, related to renunciation, the, you try to re, the, memorize these verses and try to recite them. And it's not necessary that I'm sharing with you that this verse, I will say this before, before I begin my entrance meditation. And it's not necessary you have to wait till you have the session on meditation emptiness. Even while walking here and there, you can recite this. For example, in Tibetan, Naso Iga Mendo Khachishin Sergei Kanjo Barwa Yungwa Tenam Tela Chibu Kamede Teda Tobayi Wangi Shawa This is the Tibetan version. So as you walk, you see beautiful garden, you see flowers, or you see the beautiful sunshine. Remember this, just say this, the various delightful flower blossoms and the sparkling supreme golden above stars so alluring. For none of these is their creator. It's just my metal imputation. Bunch of atoms and my mind imputes a flower there. That's it. Besides my imputation, there's nothing there's a flower from the object. They are posited by the part of thought. It is through conceptualization that the whole world is imputed. This is how we can apply in our daily, daily life. Okay, we'll say this. <clears throat> The various delightful flowers blossom, and the sparkling supreme gold in their pots stand so enduring. For none of these is their creator. They are posited by the power of thought. It is through conceptualization the world is imputed. Bhikkhuni Vajira's utterance in a fundamental vehicle sutra. The mind is demonic which views a true self. They have a wrong view. These compositional aggregates are empty. There is no being in them. Just as one designates a card, independence of money. So we are certain conventional sentient beings independent upon the aggregates. We also, you remember these, the verses um, by heart and the venerable Shavara's writings. So this morning we discuss the, when we exclude what is the conception, the word conventional analysis, ultimate analysis, what is the air? This is my question. So here, answers the, somewhere you get this answer here. Searching for reality throughout the space, throughout space meaning, throughout space meaning, the wherever you are in the world, the one finds not the periphery, nor the center, meaning that outside, inside, nowhere you can see an object of reality. All all perception sees completely. Likewise, through the thought or search of minded phenomena, one finds not even an atom of essence. Since the searching mind is not found, not seeing anything is seeing the reality. Saint Sarah's writings, which we read before, by entering into emptiness but devoid of compassion, one will not find the supreme path. By meditating upon compassion alone, one will not attain liberation but remain in samsara. The one capable of grasping the unit of the two will not remain in samsara, nor abide in personal nirvana. Okay, this verse is again the one, one which I do it as a part of my the practice on emptiness. It says that, for example, like in the dream, all our emotions stirs. We see that our sadness, our excitements, all these emotions stirs. They all related to the our viewing things subject real. So it says that the uh, this actually the the Buddha himself, the, the Buddha himself taught it. Uh, say that the in a dream, in a dream, say you are paying, you know, the the fluctuated. You have a fluctuation of the emotions. Like for example, here describes here just in a dream of a young girl, dream of a young girl or a young boy, you meet the opposite gender. There's a tremendous excitement there. She met with a boy or he met with a girl and saw his or her death. So, it's some initial meeting. There's a tremendous excitement there, and then meeting between the in the peak of the excitement, and then you see that the the other the person collapsed and died. And you see as well like the whole world has collapsed. So initially there's a tremendous excitement and the next moment there's a tremendous collapse. Your whole life is shattered as though like the life is totally meaningless, totally two extremes of the emotions. Joyce was she at the meeting and in anguish at his death. This is what exactly happens in our life. Say meeting with your mother 
and uh, there's a tremendously you say for a small child meeting with a mother there's a tremendous joy there and then the say the the loss of the mother acutely painful so this happens so this is how the world is and Joyce was she at a meeting and in anguish at his death view all phenomena thus see that everything's like a dream all coming from a mind when you don't know that they are coming from a mind they're projected by my mind your mind is being the a servant to this fluctuation of the emotions when you come to realize that these are all coming from my my own projection then this the fluctuation of emotions stops and you gain total control over your emotions okay let's read this together just as in the dream of a young girl she met with a boy and saw his death Joyce was she at a meeting and in anguish at his death view all phenomena as thus seizing of karmas and afflictions is nirvana karmas and afflictions arise from conceptual thought these arise from mental elaboration of grasping true existence elaboration ceases by only into emptiness okay this the next verse is what you can use in an actual meditation see this morning what we did is meditation on the emptiness of the, the what it is a flower we did on the flower huh the flower say and you can do that in the emptiness of the self also you can do the emptiness of the somebody somebody who you love so much or who you dislike so much or any other thing which you know looks so appealing to you can meditate on emptiness of that so for that so really to self you can use this verse neither the aggregates no different from the aggregates the aggregates don't depend on him no is he dependent on them that the thought that does not possess the aggregates what is the thought that okay this i will explain more tomorrow morning uh, who's going to remind me his hands okay pitanla yangila okay ravi ravila okay two of you are going to remind me tomorrow uh, to explain this yeah let's read the next that which dependent originates is positive to be able to be independent existence that being dependent is designated this is middle way since there is no phenomena that is not dependent originated therefore there is no phenomena that is not empty if the person is not earth not water not fire not air not space also not also conscious not all of them where is the person out of those so these two verses and the verse the last two uh, page 216 the last verse which we are going to explain tomorrow and these two verses make sure that we remember these by hearts memorize by them that them by heart and you have to use them in your own meditation on emptiness so by subjecting yourself to ultimate analysis you will subject yourself to ultimate analysis on the basis of the six elements okay let's read this once more if the person is not earth not water not fire not air not space nor also consciousness and not of all of them where is the person out of those just as a person is not truly existent because of being an aggregation of the six elements each element also is not truly existent as the aggregation of their own own constituents dharma samgiti sutra form appears as a mass of form feelings resemble bubbles in water and discrimination is like a mirage mental formation is like pendant trees consciousness is like a magical illusion so taught suri mitra suri mitra meaning the buddha next I think Nagarjuna's commentary on the awakening mind. Um, this verse is is to check whether we have understood emptiness properly. So it says that you, know, as you understand the emptiness deepens, say you think that you are getting emptiness, and on the other hand, that's a conventional world. If you tend to deny the, the conventional or reject the conventional world. And denigrate the conventional world, which means you are falling into nihilism. Whereas you understand the emptiness deepens, and you are, say, the respectful law of karma increases. You respect for the conventional operation of the world increases. That's a mark of you. You're having understood emptiness. In other words, understanding emptiness and respect for the conventional world, these two should happen. These two should complement each other. If that happens. you are on a proper track if that doesn't happen you're falling into nihilism okay let's read this 
Those who understand this emptiness of phenomena, yet also conform to the law of karma and its results. There is more amazing than amazing. There is more wondrous than wondrous. Are there was 400 verses from the middle way. When dependent on rising and seeing, ignorance does not occur. Thus through all efforts trying to find this subject. His Holiness the Dalai Lama's rain shower of feeds, a song of the full mindfulness is as a guide to the view of the a middle way by the seven Dalai Lama. But this is um, the uh, very important. Okay, the first one is that the just imagine that you are at the crossroad of the six roads crossing each other, six roads in the center of the crossroad. Then what do you see? You see so many things. Crossroad means a very busy place. There you see so many things, people, different kinds, cars, different kinds, people, some honking, right, and some cutting, and different cars. And the, so this, the seven Dalai describes as like a hazy, dualistic, uh, the illusion, dualistic, magical show. Magical show means it appears in one way, but it's empty, it's hollow there. So whatever I'm seeing, they're all like a magical show. And what are the, the six crossroads? Six crossroads to, to keep you busy, to see everything is so busy around. Your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, five plus your mental six. These are six roads which keep us so busy. We see things, we hear things. We taste the, the chocolate, and then hear the, the music, and okay, now the cool air, and I'm mentally thinking about, you know, this, what, what is going to be the next dinner, right? So like, so, oh, our mind is so busy, all the five senses, and the mental health, they're all so busy in the night, in the daytime, in the class, outside class, in the morning, again, I have to get up, oh, right? It's terrible. <laughs> Five o'clock, the bell gone. No, why not? They, they hit it only at quarter to six. Why at five o'clock? Disturb on my sleep, right? So this is all what's going in our mind. So this is like being in a very hazy, dualistic, magical show. So there's nothing really there. So gone. There's just a bunch of atoms there, right? <laughs> and then you also. Oh, I have a sound sleep when in the bed, a bunch of atoms. You are a bunch of atoms, and you as a bunch of atoms is on another bunch of atoms. That's it. And yet you solidify things are so this, that, and so forth. So this is like a magical illusion, what your mind creates. And there's nothing really there from the object, say the flower. There's nothing really from the object. It's just a bunch of atoms there. And even the atoms are also, let's say, made of electrons, protons, neutrons. Even the electrons were neutrons. The physics could not see beyond that at the moment, but in actual, it's also made of parts. The parts are not the whole. So you keep going like this, we see that there's nothing there to pick up to say that this is the one which exists intrinsically. You cannot find anything. So it's all just coming from your mind, projection. This is extremely powerful, and you could feel it. The, the say physiologically, you could feel that your emotions are instant under control. Okay. Um, so with this, the, the seven Dalai Lama reminds us to be always mindful when your you, when your emotions are under the, the, the stir like this, ups, downs, up, downs. And when you get excited, when you feel low by the external factors, be always be mindful that they're all like magical show. There's nothing really the essence there. It's all coming from a mind. Okay, let's read this together. <clears throat> At the crossroads of the six collections of the consciousness that have diverse perceptions, are seen the hazy dualistic phenomena which are based as there's a magical show that is by nature deceptive. Don't believe them to be true, but view them as having the nature of emptiness. Don't let your mind go astray, but place it within the nature of appearance and emptiness. Through not losing mindfulness, hold it within the nature of appearance and emptiness. This, okay, now this one, this one is, so then what is the reality out there? What's the reality out there? If everything's coming from the mind, what is there? From what is there? It says that there is the ultimate reality. 
ultimate reality, which is inexpressible, inexpressible, which can be described as this or that, which can be described as, say, the flower, can be described as non-flower, can be described as flower, non-flower, can be described as non-flower, the non-flower, not non-flower. It's totally inexpressible. And this, so you go to that level, it's extremely subtle, profound, that you can say that this is the this is the, the instrument that can quell my emotions, that can quell my disturbing emotions. Okay. The sphere appearing in existing phenomena is pervaded by this the space of the ultimate clear light of suchness. That's an ineffable ultimate reality. View this nature of emptiness through abandoning the mental contrivances. Don't let your mind go astray, but place it within the ambience of reality. Through not losing mindfulness, hold it within the ambience of reality. Okay, the His Holiness Fortin Dalai Lama, the is extracted from the His Holiness, the current Fortin Dalai Lama's the uh, compositions. The first one is uh, it's this is related to the uh, His own spring for the proliferation of the, the teachings of the Buddha Dharma, the, the Buddha Dharma of the, the Tibetan tradition. There were four different traditions, Sakya, Kagyu, Nyingma, Gelu. This is related to the one from the Kagyu, which I found very uh, the powerful, and I picked this up and added here. So the first one is um, His own invoke the great masters of Kagyu tradition, like Jesus Marpa, and all the lineage masters of Kaikyu. And then the second verse is about how the Mahamudra, that everything is the nature of your own, the radiance of one's own mind. For example, watching a movie, watching a movie is just the, the, the configuration of the lights on the screen. You agree with me? In the night when you watch a movie, there's nothing in the, there. On the, it's all the lights going there from the from the projector on the screen. So whatever we are seeing, these are the lights of your own mind, the radiance of one's own mind. Like the projector projecting these lights and then creating all this movie there on the screen. So there's nothing really is a movie, it's all coming from the lights of the projector. So everything that we're seeing around, that we're experiencing, they're like the radiance of one's, one's own mind, number one. And for example, as I said earlier, say that when I was a child, I see this coat, which is otherwise blue, as seen as purple. So why? Why this purple? It's supposed to be light. Light, then you, it gives me impression this like purple. Likewise, in the daytime, you see it's blue, it's because of the light. So it's, everything is the radiance of the light. Likewise, everything is the radiance of the light of one's own mind. And then this, even this mind doesn't exist objectively. So it says that, first see that everything is the nature of one's own mind. And then see that even this mind, whose radiance, everything is reflected, even this mind does not exist truly. It's like a dream. Okay. So this is the great Mahamudra. Aware the realizing the emptiness of this mind, whose radiance is reflected in the form of the, all the phenomena. Okay, let's read this together. His Holiness, the 14 Dalai Lama's prayer for proliferating the Dharma of the Snows. Venerable Marba Lozawa, Shebi Doji, and so on. Host of the precious guide you, the source of blessings. The children of our unexcelled masters of this outstanding tradition, to you all I pray, may the Buddha Dharma of the land of snows blaze forevermore. All phenomena encompassing samsara and nirvana are but the radiance of spontaneous awareness. The awareness itself, devoid of elaborations, is realized in the absence. Pervading all existences and appearances of samsara and nirvana is a great Mahamudra. May the Buddha Dharma of the land of the snows blaze forevermore. Arinigarjuna Sumshesu Dhammadadu, impermanent, suffering, and empty. These three they purify the mind. The Dhamma that is unsurpassed and purify the mind is the lack of intrinsic nature. Concluding prayer from Lama Tsunkhaba's Ocean of Reasoning, a commentary on Arinigarjuna's fundamentalism in the middle way. So, this what happens was that when the my as a student receiving teachings on the commentary on Arini, commentary by Lama Tsunkhaba on the root text of Lama Arinigarjuna, when I was receiving the teachings, and then the I saw that this verse there in Lama Tsongkhapa's commentary, he the said this prayer at the end of his commentary. I was so fascinated.
that wow this is amazing so blessed and so powerful and then i included that in my daily uh, the prayers every day i pray this i do this say this verse as a prayer one of my prayers okay let's say this together Throughout my future lifetimes, may I always be guided by the Manjushri and be able to uphold the Dharma in general and the teachings of the dependent origination in particular, even at the cost of my life. Okay, the next one is extremely important. Sadhana of the Shri Heruga excerpt. And the Shri Heruga is the name of one of the Buddhas. And in fact, the Buddha Shakyamuni, Buddha Shakyamuni himself manifested in the different forms of the Buddhas. One, one of which is Shri Hiruga. And to just see how the Buddhas, they select their own names. Even selecting the names is for the benefit of the beings. So for the Shri Hiruga, it is the, this particular Buddha's name. And uh, look at the meaning as to what it means, Shri Hiruga. There's this tradition in India where the Guru gives a name to the disciple. And in this case, the Buddhas give themselves their own names. So choose, not give, choose. Yeah. Okay, it's not for that so that I look great. It's that the beings are benefited. So the Buddhas will do anything which makes them beings happy. So Ari, Ari Deva, Bodhisattva Ari Deva, what he said is that for the Buddha the, the for the, the Buddhas, even a single breath is for the sentient beings. If the Buddha say if some ordinary people like us give name to the Buddha that helps the sentient beings he will ask for the name from you right so whatever benefits the beings is just for the sheer benefit of the beings you're getting it okay so look at this this is so powerful every time we recite Shiri Heruka Shiri Heruka Shiri Heruka and if you know the meaning every time we recite the this the sacred name of the Buddha, Shri Hiruka, it will help implant in us extremely, extremely precious imprints of the wisdom of emptiness. So precious. Okay, I'm going to explain this first. Um, the same, how our emotions arise within us. For example, like you, you see the cheesecake, and you, how many of you are fond of cheesecake with hands? I can see the many of you are fond of cheesecake. The moment I said cheesecake, everybody would like this. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So cheesecake is an object. And your mind interacts with the object. Or you, you as a person interacts with the object. And then, oh, there's a fresh cheesecake. Then the pleasant feeling comes. You like it. So you embrace this pleasant feeling. It makes your hand to move it makes your face to glow right movement takes place that's the intention so this is what is happening is that all these the emotions sadness anger attachment all these emotions somehow they are related there that there's a play of the subject and object you agree with me the play of the subject object happening and the object of course whatever it is the subject, the mind is there, the person is also there, I, I interact with the cheesecake. Okay, subject, object, interplays there. So, they finally, they, let's say for example, seeing the loss of the loss of near and dear ones is so acutely, acutely painful. So there also there's an interplay between the object and subject. Loss. And then, say for example, say you are diagnosed with Cancer. It's a shocking news. Again, object and subject in the play, and then it results in the form of a shocking news. It really shocks you. So there, what is happening is object and subject in the play is happening. You see the object is object real, you see the subject is objectively real. Okay, so objectively real object, object real subject. Two things are there. This is known as Duality. Duality meaning two. Okay, now say the Shiri Heruka. Shiri Heruka. Four. So leave the Shiri the last. Heruka Shiri. You're getting it? Heruka Shiri. Okay, let's see. 
Now, even the name the Buddha chose for himself or for herself is extreme, is all coming out of compassion towards us. Towards us. That said, we have to dissolve these two because of the interplay of these two misconception, misperception of the object as object real, misperception of the subject as object real, then the interplay of this will result into the, the, the loud sound of the miseries and shock. So, for this, we have to dismantle the two misconceptions of the two. He ru ka shiri. He. So, first, of the, let's say this, all these the, the objects with which I interact, all the objects that we interact, oh, today the morning bread, the morning bread is amazingly nice. Morning bread is good. That's extremely good. Right? Extremely good. Okay. So the, the morning bread. Even the morning bread is nothing but the radiance of my own mind. It's a bunch of atoms. Atoms which made this bread and the atoms which made the rock. There's no difference. Particularly electrons, protons, neutrons. On that level, there's no difference at all. So, but one collection of the electrons, protons, and neutrons, my, my mind, it appears as the, the very delicious bread. There's nothing, my mind, is, my mind is creating it. My mind radiates in the form of this bread. My mind radiates in the form of COVID-19. My mind radiates in the form of now the, the sun disappeared. In the daytime, my mind radiates in the form of a very beautiful sunshine. So there we see that everything is nothing but the radiance of my mind. Now the objects are resembled by the, represented by this mind. And then whose mind? My mind. So I as the person interacts with the, all the objects, the display of this mind. So the mind represents all the other objects with which I interact. I interact with you. You're getting it? So, all the other phenomena, who interacts? I interact, the person. And all the phenomena with which this person interacts, we call them as phenomena. Phenomena. So, this self, this phenomena is seen as of selfhood, the nature of the selfhood, object real. And a person who interacts with this phenomena is also seen as object real of the nature of selfhood. So this is a problem. Two misconceptions are happening. So with this, we need to see the selflessness of the phenomena, emptiness of phenomena, with which the person interacts, and the emptiness of the person, selflessness of person. So selflessness of person and selflessness of phenomena. It's for this reason the Buddha taught the selflessness transferred into two. Selflessness of person who interacts with the phenomena, and selflessness of phenomena which the person interacts, the two. So there, when you when the misconception happens, misperception of the two things happen, then all those the all agitation, anger, sadness, lamentation, all these arise. So the same with the two things. Hey, hey, ruka shiri, hey. So with the hey is the surface of the phenomena, where you see that even this mind, which represents all the other phenomena with which my, the self interacts, these are all nothing but empty of true existence. So, with the He, this solidification of the object dissolves. Ru, solidification of the person dissolves. So, what happens that once there were two there, two dual, duality, then with the He, the substance of the, the phenomena, grasping at the phenomena is object real, grasping of the mind of object real, that dissolves. Then, Ru, the substance of person who interacts with the object, solidification that dissolves. So, the duality dissolves. You're getting it? The duality, the two dissolves. So, Vedanta tradition, in Vedanta tradition, say of the two, the, the, this dissolves, the phenomenon with which the person interacts dissolves. Person's left. Is there two or one? Hey. One. one. So one is dual or non-dual? 
This is the Vedanta's version of non-duality, where the, the self is left, but the two is gone, only one is left. Whereas in Buddhism, Prasangya Madhimik's non-duality is very different. Not only the phenomena with which the person interacts that dissolves, even the person also dissolves. How many are left? One, two, zero? Zero. zero. That is non-duality. So non-duality in Buddhism is both sides dissolved, whereas non-duality in Advaita Vedanta, only the object dissolves, but the subject is left. This is the difference. Okay, so this is the non-duality. Hey, Ru. Now what is left? Non-duality is left. The, this is Hey, Ru, Ka. Ka, the non-duality. What is left is the non-duality. That is the Ka. Now what is left? Shiri is left. What mind cognizes there is this non-duality? Who cognizes non-duality? Your own wisdom, non-dual wisdom. Even this non-dual wisdom is also, it, it, that also doesn't exist objectively. Even that is non-dual, even that is non-dual with the non-duality is the object. This is the meaning of the Shiri. You're getting it? Okay. He is a selflessness of the phenomena where the mind dissolves into emptiness. Ru is the substance of person that dissolves into emptiness. What is left? Non-duality is left. That is the Ka. Then who, what cognizes this non-duality? The non-dual wisdom cognizes Your non-dual wisdom cognizes, cognizes it. Your non-dual wisdom, wisdom is also non-dual with the non-dual as object. That's the meaning of the Shiri. You're getting it? So that's amazing. If you can really reflect on this, just reciting Shiri Heru Ka, Shiri Heru Ka, Shiri Heru Ka. And if, if the meanings are reflected, then your mind can really be elevated to such a height of experience of emptiness where your mental defilements can be removed drastically. It's so powerful. Okay. So the Tibetan version. The Tibetan version of this is Shiri Heruka, Shiri Heruka, Shiri Heruka. Hene Kungu Chunasu Gyuwe Sim Te Kyu Tanyi Do Tavar Shepa Tomba Shuki Dhamme Vata. Runi Khansang Vita Do Zimbe Nandu Vata Vekube Tata Tiba Khansang Vita Dhamme Vata. Ka Ni Te Kona Ni Yu Yuse Ni Me Tumbe Soso Ni Sume Ne Vata. Shiri Ni Yu Tomba Ni Chita Wa Deshin Du Jesu Shube Ni Sume Be Ishi Ni Ewa Mugu Tuno. This is the, the Tibetan version. So you can, so those of you who know Tibetan, you can learn this in Tibetan, memorize this and recite this wherever you get the chance to go here and there. In the forest you go there, you recite this for all the insects, the spirits, the hungry goes there, you recite this for them. And otherwise you also you recite for all the human beings, everyone into something, everyone in the world, in the universe, you recite this. And how many people are now suffering in Iran? How many people suffering in Ukraine? How many people suffering in uh, the say Sri Lanka? And how many people suffering on the border? Border tensions are everywhere in the world. Just recite this, this for everyone there by the recalling the meanings of these. Okay, let's say this three times. Let's say this together. Shiri Heruka, Shiri Heruka, Shiri Heruka. He is the selflessness of phenomena, the emptiness of the mind, which is the source of everything, as it is imputed to both cause of nature. Ru is the selflessness of person, the emptiness of self that is fabricated by the web of conceptual thought that grasps the self of person. Ka is the ultimate reality, the absence of the dissonant duality of the subject object. Shiri is the non-dual exalted wisdom that abides in congruence with the emptiness of the object. This is the meaning of the Eva. Okay. <clears throat> so now the bodhicitta. Okay. Uh, so the, in the first place, the bodhicitta. Bodhicitta, of course, we talk about the bodhicitta. Uh, the the two kinds of bodhicitta. One is known as conventional bodhicitta. Uh, of course, within the bodhicitta, there are various classifications. One of which is Conventional bodhicitta and ultimate bodhicitta, yes. 
Yes. Men with flower or the emptiness of the flower? Flower, you don't do the meditate. Yeah. Okay, let's say you analyze the flower, subject of flower to ultimate analysis. It's just made of atoms. Or listen, first it's made of cells, made of chromosomes, DNA molecules, atoms. Then you want to go further? Or protons, neutrons, then? Then what is your question? What is your question? Yes. Yeah. Mm. So how do I know that I'm not imagining that like I'm not imagining that I've seen uh, you know all these things and how do I know I'm actually meditating on them? Okay. Uh this good question. How do you know that I'm just imagining or I'm actually meditating? This is a good question. Okay, let's see. On the, um, are you Lakshmi? Are you Lakshmi? Uh, are you Lakshmi or not? Okay, your name is Lakshmi? Are you sure? Are you imagining or are you sure? I'm, you're sure. You're made of, your, your body is made of atoms? Not sure. You're sure. That's not imagination. Now your body cells are made of chromosomes. You studied that before in the school. Are you sure of that? You studied that, are you sure? Or just imagining? Are you sure? So this is how. See, uh, the um, one thing is that people, how do you know that there's a pen? What is this? this is a pen? How do you know there's a pen? It may be a ghost pen, right? Okay, don't go to such extent. Respect the conventional conventionality. If you don't respect the conventionality, you have to end up in medical hospital. What is this? This happened. How do you know this happened? Are you a human being? I don't know. <laughs> okay, I don't know. Somebody punches you. And if you somebody punches you, still dead. I don't know whether it's punch. If you, deal, if you see this, then it's a real reflection. Whereas if somebody punches you, hey, how dare you punch, you punch back? Which means that your earlier question is not a genuine question. You're getting it? So the thing is that sometimes the great teachers, they said that you imagine it not, it's real or not, just pinch yourself. This is the, some of the great masters, said, they advise us. Pinch yourself hard, right? Pinch yourself. You want somebody to pinch you? Right? Okay. Pinch yourself, then you realize that it's real. Right? It's not just imagination. Okay, this is how we have to evaluate. And the, so therefore in Buddhism, I would say in the teachings of Buddha, there's a tremendous emphasis on your cognitive sharpness. Tremendous emphasis on the need to study the Dharma well. Need to be very smart. Don't follow things blindly. You have to make sure that whatever you learn, this is something that you can accept it. Meaning that it is cognitively sensible. It is, co it is cognitively logical. If it is not logical, don't reject it directly. Don't accept it easily. Right? So this is so important. So the point is that we have to know. Therefore, the knowledge is so important, not just imagination. If you could remember, when talk about the emptiness, I said that this is the discovery which the Buddha made. This is not what the Buddha invented. I made this very clear. You're right? You can invent ideas, but these are not the discoveries. Discoveries means what you see and what is the reality should to tally. You're getting it? Imagination is where what you imagine and what is the reality may not tally. Okay, good. Yes. Yes. Selflessness and emptiness, these two are synonymous in a loose sense. 
in a loose sense these two are synonymous and if you want if you why if you ask me why why in a loose sense why not in a strict sense in a strict sense you have to go to the different schools different schools they have the different versions of understanding what is selflessness so according to prasangika selflessness and emptiness in a loose sense these two are same yeah yes uh, on the four essentials, the essential emptiness, we focus on the parts, but on the dependent or the origination, we say it's uh, dependent on the causes, the parts, and the implications. So we only focus on the second part. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, this good question. Thank you. Anybody who likes to help me? The question is the question is that when you talk about the four essentials, there, the emphasis on the, empty, the essential of understanding the emptiness of the objects being intrinsically one with its parts. So, is the parts means dependent origination of the whole dependence on the parts. Which level of dependent origination is that? First, second, third? Second. Very good. So, there's emphasis only on the dependent, the second level of dependent origination, not on the first and second, was not on the first and third. Why? This is a good question. Anybody who likes to help me? Huh? Anyone? Yes. Okay. So the um, what Tom is saying is that we can they apply this to the first and third as well. This is what she's saying. I agree with you. So the idea is that the four essentials is not the only reasoning to establish emptiness. To establish emptiness, there are so many reasons. So many reasons are there. One of which is that the flower is empty of objective existence, or the I, the person is empty of objective existence, because he or she is dependent originated. Finish. The reasoning, as simple as that. So, dependent origination, the reasoning of dependent origination is respected as the king of the reasoning to establish emptiness. Because in all these, dependent origination is coming into play. For example, that it's not one with its parts. It's not intrinsic one with its parts, which means that it comes to existence by dependence on the parts, dependence of parts, so the parts cannot be the dependent. Parts cannot be the flower, parts cannot be the, the self. It depends on the self. So, just say the self does not exist objectively because he is dependent originated, because she is dependent originated. As simple as that. There are so many reasonings. It's not necessary that one reasoning should cover all the level of dependent origination. You, it, it depends on you. You can say that, for example, so the flower it does not exist objectively because it depends on the causes and conditions. That's also fine. The flower does not exist objective because it's coming coming to being by depends on your mental imputation. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Okay, so now bodhicitta. Okay, first of all, what is bodhicitta? Bodhicitta is um, the is the primary mind. I'm putting it technically as well. It's a primary mind which wishes to become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. Is a primary mind, is a primary mind which wishes to become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. And this definition is what you find in Arimatriya's text, Abhi Samaya Alankara, Ornament of Clear Realization. This definition is what you find in Arimatriya's text, Ornament of Clear realization, Arya Maitreya, ornament of clear realization. Okay, a primary mind, Bodhicitta is a primary mind which wishes to become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. In Tibetan, Simge Pani Shindush Yanda Zobe Chanju. These are two lines from Arya Maitreya's text. Simge Pani Shindush Yanda Zobe Chanju. Okay. The primary mind, primary mind which wishes to become Buddha for the benefit of sentient beings. 
So some of you may be wondering why primary mind? Why this word primary? Right? Okay. Uh, let me explain this here. Your mind see, is more related to the Buddhist psychology. Study the Buddhist psychology. Usually, I don't like to use the word Buddhist psychology. It's a psychology. See, bread is a bread. There's no what French bread is there. <laughs> if you if you eat the French bread, breast, French French bread, then the French hunger will disappear. No hunger will disappear. That's it. Be it French hunger or British hunger or Indian for hunger or Tibetan hunger. There's no difference. Hunger will disappear. So likewise, psychology is psychology. But why I'm compelled to use the word Buddhist psychology sometimes is because that the, in the world people study psychology mostly the the say the Freudian psychology, Sigmund Freud, his psychology. And the when when I say psychology, people just connect with Freud. So therefore, to to remove this misconception that psychology is not only the Freud psychology, there is an extremely well say the drafted, well formulated, uh, the refined Buddhist psychology. Psychology there taught by the great, but the Buddha himself and the Indian masters. So which we can call as the Buddhist psychology. Okay. Um, in the study of Buddhist psychology, we see that the, the mind, which is empirical mind, which we, we can experience, this empirical mind, um, this mind is classified into two forms. One is the mind in general. Say when we speak about, let's say, that the, um, let's say a particular school, or let's say the uh, or let's say Singapore government. Is there anybody from Singapore? Yes. Let's say Singapore government is very efficient. When it's a Singapore government is very efficient, then the Li Sing, right? Your name? Sing Li, not Li Sing, Sing Li. Okay, so if I say Singapore government is so efficient, so Sing Li will be Okay, interested? And Singh's son, your name? Huh? Azia. Azia. Okay. Azia and Singh Lee becomes all that. What is he talking about? Singapore government is so efficient. Then Singh Lee may ask me in more detail. Singapore government has many departments. Which of the departments you are more precisely talking about the efficiency? Department of Education, Department of Transportation, Department of External Affairs, Department of Internal Affairs, Department of the Transportation, what? Department of what? Health and so forth. Which? Then I may say that Department of Home Affairs. Because there, the policy for policy for for the government to make sure that everybody has a house to live is amazing. It's amazing. Lee Kuan Yew, the first prime minister. The, what I learned is that the moment he became the prime minister, he made two commitments. He said, I promise that every citizen of Singapore has a shelter to live under, number one. It's amazing. That's a very practical uh, thing. Number two, I'll make sure that every citizen of Singapore has a work to earn a living. Two promises. That's amazing. I really, when I think about this, wow, these must be the great bodhisattvas. The people who become the leader, who fight to become the leader, to help the people, to make sure that the people are taken care of not to extract money from the people. This is amazing, amazing. Okay, so if I say that, okay, when I say that, oh, the Singapore government is so efficient, most of us will be, oh, it must be efficient. That's it. Whereas if somebody from Singapore, who, is, who knows Singapore so well, so closely, will ask which department you are talking about. There are so many departments. You're getting it? So likewise, when I say that my mind is, 
I'm, the, I'm feeling good today. My mind is feeling good today. Your mind has so many departments. Right? Your department of intelligence, department of meditation, department of creating problems to the community. Right? Department of abusing others. Which department you're talking about that you're feeling good about? Which department? So some people, that department of meditation is terrible. The moment they sit like this, <laughs> some people, that department of mathematics is terrible. 2 plus 4 plus 2, they say 23. <laughs> it's terrible. Department of mathematics, mathematical calculation is terrible. So we see that when you say the, the mind, I feel, my mind, I feel good today. Which department of the mind? So tell me, they say various departments in the government. On what basis the departments are created? Anybody? On what basis the, government, the departments are created? By function. Huh? By functions. By the need. By the need. Abhishek? By the function. Okay. I want, I'm sure that all of you will agree to this. By the functions, by the needs of the people. Right? By the function. So likewise, that department of the mind, the department of mind, these are the functions of the mind. How many such functions of mind are there? So some people, some people, they see you, they see you instantly, they mind so fast to scan you from the top to the bottom. <laughs> so fast. Wow, that's amazing. Right, so fast. Right? So what he has the, the, the watch? What kind of watch? What kind of shoes? What kind of the what? Gucci belt? <laughs> what? A scan so fast. It's amazing. Some people, even if tell him, tell him that, that, that what I put on, this is Gucci. What do you mean by Gucci? <laughs> what? Some they are so fast in scanning. Right? And some people, the function of the mind to meditate is so effective, so alert, fresh, for hours and hours. Whereas when you assign the person to, to go to administer the works, they are terrible, hopeless. They are terribly hopeless, right? They, they, everything, is, everything becomes chaotic. And some people, the administration work is, the skill is amazing. They get things, things done so well. At the moment, you do the mathematical calculation, it's hopeless. Right? And some people, they are so good in science, not good in language. Some people are so good in language, not good in science. So these are all the different functions of a mind. You're getting it? And these functions of mind, on the basis of these functions, the way for the government Religious with government, the functions are the functions on the basis of function, departments are created. On a mind, the functions of the mind, mental factors are assigned. You're getting it? Mind and mental factors. Mind is the general mind, and the functions, special functions of mind are referred to as mental factors. So some people also translate it as secondary secondary minds. If you translate the, the functions of mind as secondary minds, then the main mind, the primary, what? The mind in general is referred to as the primary mind. So primary mind is the mind in general. Mind in general, which encompasses all the, the functions of the mind. That's a part of it, but the general mind is known as the primary mind. And the, on the basis of the functions, we speak about the mental factors. Primary mind and the mental factors, or the mind and mental factors. Okay, good. So primary mind which wishes to become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. This is about the Chitta. Okay. So with this we see that yes. Sunil? Yes. Yes. Okay. All sentient beings. What do you mean by all sentient beings? All human beings or what? Anyone? Raise hands, raise hands, raise hands, raise hands here. Who have, uh -huh. Who have senses? Who have senses? Who have senses? The Buddha also? Buddha is a sentient being? 
Buddha is essential being or not? Huh? Buddha is essential being or not? Yes. Recent yes. Okay, three, four people in support of the. Your name? Kapil. Kapil. Okay, Buddha is not essential. No way, Buddha is not essential being. Recent? Okay, Kapil, look around. <laughs> who are the people who disagree with you? Okay. Okay, raise hands, raise hands. Who disagree? Okay, the girl here, what's your name? Sonamla. Why the Buddha is not a sentient being? Let's listen to Sonamla. Huh? Perfect, your answer is perfect. But why? What, what makes you think the Buddha is not a sentient being? Okay. Sentient being has a connotation of not fully enlightened. You getting it? Sentient being has a connotation which is not fully enlightened. Like people like us in samsara, these are sentient beings. Buddha is the one who has transcended all these limitations. Right? One with the limitations is known as sentient being. One without limitations is known as the Buddha. So Buddha is no sentient beings. Yes. Those beings who always go through birth and death, this is this is sentient being. Okay, anybody who agrees with Kaya? You agree? Who does not agree with this? Who does not agree with this? That the beings who go in round, but that, but that, but that, this is known as a sentient being. Those who do not agree, raise hands. Those who do not agree with this, raise hands. <laughs> okay, you agree? Not agree? You don't agree? Why not? Birth and death. Yeah, but oh, okay. Ceiling. Yeah. Okay, ceiling is saying that even the Buddha is in following this rule. Come back, <laughs> right? So the Buddha is not a sentient being. But it's coming back like this. Anybody else? Yes. I say it again. Enlightenment is it before Buddhahood? Is your question? Okay. Enlightenment. There are say graduation. Gradu graduation. Graduation happens before PhD or after PhD. Hey, graduation happens before PhD or after PhD? Before. So you cannot graduate PhD. Huh? Graduation happens before college or after college? So can you graduate school? Can you graduate from school? Can you graduate from, can, can you graduate from the, the college? University? PhD? You can complete PhD? Right? Okay, in other words, enlightenment, there are various levels of enlightenment. Some just attain fearlessness, remove the afflictive obscurations. There's also one enlightenment. This is partial enlightenment. Nirvana is a partial enlightenment. Where you attain the what? You remove the cognitive obscurations. That is full enlightenment. You're getting it? So Buddhahood is the full enlightenment. Before attaining Buddhahood, you have to attain Nirvana. You have to attain Nirvana according to the Prasangika. Okay, I don't want to confuse things. Say before Buddhahood, you have to attain Nirvana. Which means you have to attain the partial enlightenment before the full enlightenment. Okay. Anyone else who disagree with what Kyle said? Sentient being is somebody who goes through this Birth and death, birth and the round of the birth and death, birth and death. Anyone who disagrees? One, two, three. Okay. Um, let me say, uh, Philip, why do you dis disagree? Uh, I would say, uh, if you have a mind, it's the same thing. If you have a mind. Okay, if you have a mind, which means Buddha is a sentient being. Okay, so what we said is Buddha is not a sentient being. This uh. is. This is the constitution. <laughs> this is the, the basic constitution. You cannot transgress it. Buddha is not sentient being. Okay. 
one there, Philip, uh, Michael. Michael, yes. Uh, Bodhisattva, they come back. Bodhisattva, they come back, yes. So, uh, All the Bodhisattvas are sentient beings. Again, another constitution, part of constitution, clause in the constitution. All Bodhisattvas are sentient beings. The Buddhas are not sentient beings. Okay, anyone else? I'm quite surprised. No answer. Okay, Rachel. Do they sense what? Well, anything. Do they are sense? Of course. Cognitively very active. <laughs> Anyone else? Ninjala. Okay. Are the um, okay? Which means are they uh, the essential beings or not? Who attain arathship, they will not come back. They will not, you know, go into this loop of but that, but that. But they are still sentient beings. Are these? Are these what you're saying? You say yes. <laughs> then I will say, okay, this is the correct answer. Say arahats, meaning those who attain the partial liberation, partial enlightenment, who remove the afflictive obscurations. These beings, they attain nirvana. Nirvana means freedom from this loop, freedom from the loop, but they are still not Buddhas, they still have the cognitive obscurations. You're getting it? So from this, what we're going to learn is, the okay, who brought this up? The Sunil, thank you for bringing this up. We have to learn few technical, and I'm quite, I would be very unhappy if the answer is not coming from this group, that what do you understand by sentient being? Anyone? Anyone? Yes. Beings dwelling in samsara? Beings dwelling in samsara. Hansla? Uh, all the beings within samsara. In other words, same answer. Universe is a samsara or not? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, my question is still not answered. Anyone? Young Bella. Okay, let's listen to Young Bella. Please rescue me. That's why I'm not satisfied. Okay, did you hear what Young Bella said? What did he say? Sentient beings as opposed to the Buddhas, meaning that all those who are not Buddhas are sentient beings. You're getting it? Don't forget it. Sentient beings as opposed to Buddhas. You're getting it? And then Ninjala brought up Arhad. Arhad as opposed to Samsari beings. You're getting it? So these are the, the, the hey, the bend, write down. Don't raise hand. Write down. <laughs> Sentient, sentient being as opposed to the Buddhas. Okay, let me say the Buddhas are Arhats, Aryas. We're going to learn three words. Buddhas, Buddhas, Aryas, no, Arhats and Aryas. What, what is the difference among these three? The first one is Buddha, second one is Arhat. Third one is Arya, Aryas. Okay, the first one Buddha. To know Buddha, you have to know what is sentient. Uh, the opposite of that, opposite of Buddha is a sentient being. Any 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 being who is not a Buddha is sentient being. You're getting it. Okay, first listen. Second, what second? Arahats. What is Arahat? Arahat as opposed to. Samsaric beings. Any person who is any being who is not an arahat is samsaric beings. Sentient being and samsaric beings, these two are not synonymous. You're getting it? 
they they can they can overlap they can overlap but the meanings are different buddhas as opposed to sentient beings arahats as opposed to samsari beings then what is third arya beings aryas arya meaning superior beings aryas as opposed to ordinary beings what marks somebody as arya what marks somebody as ordinary anyone raise hands alhamdulillah Okay, Chinsam is saying a being who has realized emptiness. What do you want to say? Somebody who has, uh, who has reached the minimum the path of seeing. And then you added something? Who has? No, Chinsam did not say that you realize emptiness. Have a nice ear. What did you say? Directly, you added now or before? Are you sure? Okay, I have to fix my ear. Okay. Okay. So, a being who has real, who has a direct realization of the emptiness, and what Hilton has said is, a being who has reached minimum the path of seeing. You are getting it? These two are same. These two answers is just the same. Somebody who has reached the path of seeing and above. This is the Arya beings. What do you mean the path of seeing? Somebody who has seen, who has directly seen emptiness. That is the path of seeing means somebody who has seen directly, who has seen emptiness directly. That is the path of seeing. Question? Ben, what? Uh, about Arya, but I'm not sure what's the Arya beings. Arya means Arya. Arya means a being who has directly, who has directly seen emptiness, or he who cognizes emptiness directly, who realizes emptiness directly. Okay, so now we are done. Buddha says supposed to. <coughs> Sentient beings and Arahas as opposed to samsaric beings and then Aryas as opposed to Okay, raise, raise, raise your hands those who <coughs> those who are doing NMC Those who did NMC or doing MC, NMC Raise your hands Okay, how many raise hands? One, two, three Kishiman, four, five, and those who did <coughs> NDC with hands. <coughs> okay, except for <coughs> Yam, Yambela, all those who raise hands will be under penalty. I've been expecting answer from these people, right? Only Yambela saved me. Oh, the Pinzole. What you are you are in the category of penalty or not? Huh? Not. Okay. Yes. What's your question? <coughs> Arias as opposed to ordinary beings. What do you mean the ordinary beings? Somebody who is yet to realize emptiness directly. Yes. <laughs> okay, atom is not emptiness. Atom is not emptiness. Atom is emptiness or not? Why not? Pablo, why not? Let's listen to Pablo. Because it's not the ultimate analysis. You can do more analysis. You can go into smaller pieces of parts. Okay, where's Maria? Where's Maria? Okay, Maria. Why do you think the seeing emptiness, emptiness not a, a, a thing? No, atoms are not emptiness. Why not? Okay, say yes. Why atoms are not the emptiness? Because atoms are still seeing something. Still, they are still seeing something. Okay. 
there is some PDF there. And the form is presented at the high school here in Kathmandu. So it's just near that. Okay, now you have already studied MTNS minimum for the last three, four days. I expect more, more structured answer. Reasons, 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 reasons. Oh, no, no hands coming up. Okay. The Tudan Dizela. Which one? Emptiness. Thank you. This is what I'm expecting. This is what we learned. Atoms are positive phenomena, and emptiness should necessarily be negative phenomena, particularly non affirming negative. This is what I'm expecting. You're getting it? So we have to know the technicalities. We have to know the technicalities. This is why the study of the Nathan Master's course, Nathan Supreme course, they are extremely, extremely useful so that we can learn the technicalities. Once you learn these technicalities, don't just uh, get stuck with your own thinking. You know, you should be able to integrate what you know with the technicalities that you've learned. Positive, negative phenomena, all this we learned already. It forms very nobody can deny you. Otherwise, people continue to debate with you. But you say why the atoms are not why the atoms are not empty? Because the atoms are positive phenomena, empty is negative phenomena. Right? Emptiness should always be negative phenomena and a positive phenomena cannot be emptiness because positive phenomena, you say the emptiness should necessarily be negative phenomena. Finish. Nobody can debate against you. It's very crystal clear answer. But you're good. Okay. So now the... Yes. Yes. Um, so we said that Buddhas, uh, sentient beings are all beings who are not Buddhas. My question was, is a rock, for example... Buddha is not a sentient being. I know, you said sentient beings are all who are not, as opposed to Buddhas. So my question is, is a rock, for example, a sentient being? No, it does not have... Okay, say, what are the qualifications of sentient beings? Wrong, is it a, is it wrong, is it a Buddha? It's not a Buddha. So is it a sentient being? It's not a sentient being. Say, the beings, the basic qualification that he, it, or, it or he or she should should be being. A being meaning somebody who has a mind. Sentient. Somebody who has a mind. And having mind, then the mind where the mental defilements are removed completely, that person is known as a Buddha. Those who mind those whose minds are not removed of the mental Deformance completely, they still have the mental deformance, they are the sentient beings. Yes. So are plants Buddhas or sentient beings? So who? Plants. Plants. It's a good question. <laughs> hey, the plants are Buddhas or sentient beings? <laughs> huh? They are sentient beings. They are neither. Some say they are neither. Some say they are sentient beings. Some say oh, let's could be let's give them the credit they are Buddhas. <laughs> right. Let's be kind to them, say they are Buddhas. Some say no, neither. Okay, plants are neither. Plants are not sentient beings, not the Buddhas, because they don't have mind. And you will debate with I know. <laughs> right? The plants they respond to the, the the stimulus. For example, very strange phenomena the the, the I say some plants. When this when they feel the, the threats from insects attacking them, they will send information to all the other plants, saying that there's a threat there. Be careful, right? So, for this, what is that? The plants are sentient or not? Do they have mind or not? No. Why not? How not? It's not why not. How not? Huh? Anyone? Yes. Okay, this is classification of the what? 
sentient beings. So the Buddhas are sentient beings. They can move from one to the other. Buddhas, they have consciousness and they can move from point to But it's contaminated. But also consciousness and they move from one. Which means the arhats, arhats, you know, after becoming, after leaving the body, so they are Buddhas, right? They might, they doesn't, they don't fulfill the, the criteria. Okay, so basically, what I don't like, the better would be instead instead of trying to be very comprehensive, just say first, what is the mark of somebody having mind? Somebody being a sentient. Sentient and sentient being we can differentiate. Somebody who has a mind. Somebody who has a mind should be that. Somebody who can move from one place to the other place voluntarily. You're getting it? So, animals are sentient beings, no doubt. No doubt. Buddha being a tree and it's like there was some stone. Buddha being a tree. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. There are some very interesting stories there. Buddha's little tree, it gives shelters to the people. Very poetic. <laughs> what is poetic? Don't take it too literally. <laughs> <laughs> this for the small children, not for the elders. Right? So when you are when you are age when you are age two or three right when you age two, two or three two or three when you could you when you start to speak you say a for apple the parents will be very happy good right when you are already age 10 12 still a for apple <laughs> parents will be very upset <laughs> then you you already reach age 20 <laughs> still you say a for apple <laughs> it's a disaster you're getting it for small children. Oh, Buddha is a tree. Buddha is a flower. It gives you happiness. It's for small children, right? Don't take it too literally. <laughs> okay. How do you distinguish between Aryas and Arhats? This is a serious question. Anybody? Anybody? Okay, let, let us do one thing. Let us make things even clearer. So we already made some clarity. We already made things clear to some extent. Buddhas as opposed to? Sentient beings. Arahats as opposed to? Samsari beings. Ari as opposed to? Ordinary beings. So now, let us be more precise. How would you demarcate between Buddha, Arahats and Aryas? So then you will see the difference between Arhats and Aryas. Anyone? Anyone? Yes. Say it again. Arhat. So Buddha is in the Ohinayana path. <laughs> Buddha is the best of the Arhat. Supreme of the Arhat. Anybody else? Anyone else? Namsala. Aryas are? Okay, till for the Bodhisattvas, till seven Bumi, one is Arya. From the Bumi, one, or from part of the accumulation? <laughs> okay, shaken now. Right, I'm sorry, shaken. Okay, anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Okay, okay, Raviji. Uh, Arya is uh, out of the uh, samsara. Okay, Arya, Arya is somebody who is out of samsara. Who is Arya or Arya or Arad? Arad, Arad. Arad is somebody who is already escaped from samsara. Who is freed from samsara is Arahad. Good. Arya being uh, from the Buddha and Arya is from the Buddha. Yes. Arya is not from the Buddha. What about Arahas? Are they Arya or not? Arahas are also Arya. So you said the Arya means who is not reached samsara. 
not red, not cross samsara. So Arya sold it crossed. Arya has sold it crossed. Yes. So Arya is Arya or not? I think that's right. So Arya is Arya's. Arya's Arya means those who have not yet crossed the samsara. Arya has not crossed samsara. All Arya, all Arya's. All Arya's have not crossed. What about Arhats? Arhats have crossed samsara. Arya's or not? <laughs> okay, so this secular debate happening. You can identify this secular thing. Anyone else? Okay, Lusanla. Uh, secular. Uh, like what about Buddhas? That, Buddhas are there arihats or not? So Buddhas are not arhats. Buddhas remove the corner of obscuration. Okay, now look. Let's work on this. To make this, this is a very important point. Say, what we learned is that the uh, that our job is to, to discover this Buddha nature. To unravel this Buddha nature fully. For that matter, what should we do? Hey. Dharmanaliza, we have to remove the mental defilement so that the Buddha nature inside will become manifest, it will glow fully. You're getting it? So now let us make the distinction between the Aryas, Arahats, and Buddha, Buddha on the basis of what degree of mental defilements one has removed. Okay, on that level, from that point of view, we try to explain what is Arahat, what is Arya, and what is Buddhahood. Anybody who would like to explain what is Buddhahood from what is Buddha on, from that on that point of view? Anyone? Yes, dear. <laughs> okay. Now I expect technical answers. I know what you are saying, but I want the things to be technically put forth. Anyone? His hands? Okay. Yangila? Buddhas are the ones who removed both the mental departments, afflictive obscurations as well as cognitive obscurations. We need to learn the technical term. Buddhas are the ones who removed all the mental defilements, afflictive obscurations as well as cognitive obscurations. These are the Buddhas. Done. What is next? Arahat. What is Arahat? Raise hands. Dora Manaliza. Arahats. Are the ones who remove the afflictive obscurations, but they are still left with the carnal obscurations. Oh, you agree? You agree? Okay, anyone else with a different view? Petunla, anyone else? Ninja, you have a different view? Okay, same, but they are on, they reach the path of normal learning. This is the additional point, otherwise same. Okay. Ajunla? So the Aryan we don't don't talk about Aryas for timing. Just ar what do you understand by Arahats? Related to the removal remove metal defilements. They are yet to remove the 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 acquired afflictions. No, no, they have removed the acquired and the innate afflictions. So, what about the cognitive obscurations? I suspect huh? They still have. Okay. So, how many you have a divergent answer? Anyone? Answer thus far is that 
What is arhat? Arhat is someone who, who has eradicated the afflictive obscurations. And afflictive obscurations, say, acquired in need. I'm not going to touch on this for the time being, but um, we can do it a little later. You, somebody who says, remove the afflictive obscurations, but still are left with the kind of obscurations. This is the answer thus far. Anybody else who has a different answer? No, you have already given the answer. Anybody else? Oh, what happened to NMC? What happened to NDC? Okay, here, Yangila. So they still have the subtle self and attitude to be removed. They still have the self and attitude to be removed. Anybody else? What is Arahat? Yes. But tell me what precisely is Arahat? Tell me. Then what about the what about the the, the Sherpak is a Pratik Buddhas? No Arahats there? There are other Sherpas, but they, they travel from the No, what is Arahat? Okay. L let's listen to things they gonna. So they, they, they attain the personal liberation, which means they are yet to attain Buddhahood. They still have the kind of obscurations. Answer is much more, still, still the same. Anybody else with a different answer? Tajinla. They still have the self-sufficient self energy, which means they still have the kind of obscurations. So your answer is the same as others. Anyone else with a different answer? Yes. They have also, I think, the they already left. They already left. No afflictive obscuration, they have left. Any additional answer? Raviji? Uh, I don't know if it's not those who are being described. They like the selflessness of the person. Okay, it becomes a little more complicated. Okay, Manjariji, you like to answer? Anybody else? No, what happened to he, hey yes? I tried. Huh. Do you mind if I So they still have the subtle sense and attitude. This is what they are saying. What they are saying, what many others are saying. Anybody else? Okay, Sijirla. Because they have still have the corner of obscurations. Same answer. Anybody else? <laughs> yes. <laughs> still have the appearance of some which is they still have the corner of obscurations. Same answer. Anyone else? <laughs> yes. But they realize that that is what everybody agrees. Yes, over there. Oh, oh no answer coming up. Now let's hope. Okay, which means sentient beings mean they are not Buddhas. They still have the corners of obscurations. Same answer. Okay, so what happened to NMC here at the Digila? Yeah, I'm just wondering uh, how the Pali tradition see Arhats. The, the, the bit you're explaining right now is like Nirvana. It is Nirvana, Arhats um, Nirvana, and not Buddhahood. But uh, Pali tradition, they really believe uh, Arhats. Of course, no, no, no. You go to any standard, the Theravada countries, very standard Theravada scholars. Nobody will say that the say the when you attain Arhat, Sharvaka's Arhat ship, Pratikul's Arhat ship, you attain Buddha. Nobody will say this. Because they ask me in a Buddhist. 
especially with this center of Geneva, run by Sri Lankan and Burmese nuns. Uh, they ask me if His Holiness the Dalai Lama is other. That was the first question. Yes, because for them, for them, for them, for them, it's not the most important. It's not the most important. For them, their goal is Aradhship. They don't aim to become Buddhas. For them, this is their goal. Okay. Okay, now the... Um, okay, those who have already hands, old holes, old hands, put down. <laughs> <laughs> Any fresh hands are there? Okay, Pinzole. Please save us now. Oh, Aras don't have Bodhicitta. Buddha, Buddha is not Anahat? Buddha is he Arahat not? Buddha is the best of the Arahats. Don't forget it. Buddha is the supreme of the Arahats. You're getting it? Buddha is the Bodhicitta, the most refined Bodhicitta. Okay, now, I know, I see, as you were saying, I see that this hand is already, I've seen this before. <laughs> right? Okay, so the Arahat, Arahat, Arahats are those who have removed the afflictive obscurations. Stay there, don't add more. You're getting it? Don't add more saying that those who have uh, removed the afflictive obscuration but still have the conscious obscuration, still have the substantive attitude. Don't add anything. Just say the ones who have removed the afflictive obscurations are the Arahats. So the Buddha, is he Arahat? Yes. yes, because he has removed the afflictive obscurations. That's it. If you say that Arahats are those who remove the afflictive obscurations and who still have the corner obscurations, then Buddha is not Arahat. You're getting it? So just say that somebody has removed the afflictive obscurations. Full stop. Don't add more. Right? Don't add more. If you add more, then it'll make things worse. You're getting it? Yes, Lord Sanallah. Huh? Okay, Arahas, are they Buddhas? Okay, human beings, are they girls? Human beings, are they girls? Girls, are they human beings? Yes. Human beings, are they girls? No, human beings, there are two. Girls and non-girls, both are there. Right? So the Buddhas, the Arahas, are they Buddhas? Within Arahas, there are two. Arahas who are Buddhas and who are non-Buddhas. So Shravaka are a personal Buddha. Personal liberation seekers, arahats who are personal liberation seekers, they are non-Buddha arahats, but the Buddhas are the, uh, also arahats. So arahats are there too. You're getting it? Okay. So now the arahats become, we become clear with the arahats. What about the Aryas? What do you, what do you, how do you class, how do you talk, what do you understand by the Aryas? Aryas? Hey. What, what is Aryas? What is Arya? Somebody who has direct realization of emptiness or selflessness. What Shunzumla said? What Omula said? Omu, right? Okay. Somebody, you know, and somebody who has realized emptiness directly, that person should have reached the path of seeing. It can be part of seeing or above. Anybody who is the part of seeing and above, they are known as Aryas. You're getting it? They are known as Aryas. And Aryas, are they Arahats or not? No. They're not Arahats. They're not. Arahats, are they Aryas or not? Yes. Aryas are, are, are Aryas. Aryas are not Arahats. What do you mean by Aryas are not Arahats? Because within Aryas, there are Arahats and non Arahat Aryas are there. You're getting it? Let's say that, let's say that the um, Aryan Arahat is what? Somebody who has seen emptiness directly plus having removed the afflictive obscurations. But simply by seeing emptiness directly does not necessarily remove all the afflictive obscurations. You're getting it? Somebody who has realized emptiness directly, but not yet removed the afflictive obscurations. They're all Aryas, not Arahats. 
Only when they remove the afflictive options completely, then they become Arya as well as Arahant. On top of that, when they remove the corner of obscurations, then they become Arya, Arahant as well as Buddhas. So the Buddhas are the Aryas as well as Arahats plus Buddhas. You getting it? Okay, this says, do they accumulate negative karmas? The non negative karmas. Negative karmas are a very strong word. Negative karmas. For negative karmas, we need what? Self grasping ignorance and self centered attitude, both are required. Self grasping is already got rid of. So, negative karma is not accumulated. But the contaminated karmas, yes. Contaminated karmas and negative karmas are different. You're getting it? Contaminated karma, virtuous, virtuous karmas are contam can be contaminated karmas. All the virtues that we do, they're all contaminated. Contaminated by believing in things that are objectively real. But they're not negative karmas. Negative karmas, the result is suffering, manifest suffering. So the arahats have already eradicated them. Uh, they freed themselves from the cause of the negative, the, the three kinds of suffering. So they will not, uh, they will not accumulate negative karmas. Yes. Okay. Yes. Hmm. Okay, that's a good question. And is it me or whose responsibility is that? Okay, right? So you should have been a little nicer. You should have said that I'm supposed to remind you, right? Saying that you did not touch this. <laughs> right? So you're blaming me. Okay, I'm joking. Okay, what's the question? That the Lakshmi is asking? Hey, in other words, what exactly is cognitive obscurations? This question, right? Shall we do it or not? It's already, um, it's already 20 minutes past. Want to do it? Huh? So you leave it on me. <laughs> if you leave it on me, I'll not do it. Do it, not do it. Huh? I don't know what is it. Yeah. What is it? Yeah. <laughs> what is it? Yeah. Huh? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Actually, this is the right time. <laughs> Say. Imagine that we go to Mount Kailash. And you have you you have your blue glasses on. Blue glasses on. You look at Mount Kailash, what will you see? Blue snow. You're getting it? You'll see blue snow. And how many you believe that oh there's a blue snow or you will not believe in it? You'll not believe in it. So here what happens is that your mind interacts with the snow. Right? The mind interacts with the snow. Snow is the object and your mind is the subject. When your, your mind interacts with the object, when the subject interacts with the object, how these two interact, your mind actually does not really go there to the subject, to the object, right? Your eyes really go, don't move to the, to the snow. So there, how these two interact is through activities. There are two actions. One, the object appears, and the mind, then the mind engages with the object. You're getting it? There are two activities. One is the activity of the appearance and the activity of engaging. There are two activities there. This is how the mind interacts with the object. You're getting it? You're tired? <laughs> You're tired? We'll take a break. Huh? You're tired or why should you do it? Huh? Okay. So the mind, when the mind interacts with the object, there are two activities happening. What are the two activities? Yes. 
object appears to the, the mind and the mind engages with the object or the mind apprehends the object. So act of appearance, act of appearing and act, act of apprehending, these two things are happening. You're getting it? So when you look at the snow with the, the blue goggles on, you see it's blue snow. So the snow appears as blue, yes, no. And this appearance is deceptive. Yes, no. But your mind does not approve that it is blue. Your mind does not interact with the snow as blue. You're getting it? So in terms of your, in terms of your recognition of the snow, it is not deceptive. In terms of the appearance, there's a deception there. You're getting it? So appearance-wise, there's deception. It appears blue, but your mental consciousness will not approve that as blue. It not interact with the snow as blue. You're getting it? Okay, so that's mistake happens on the appearance level, not on the apprehending level. You're getting it? Okay, so um, the say so now let's look at the look at this object. What is this? How does this appear to you? Object real or subject real? Object real. So this appearance, the flower appears as object real. Deceptive, non-deceptive. Louder. Deceptive. Louder. Deceptive. Okay, Kaya, what happened to you? Now you're also tired. Otherwise, you are, you you are, you should be very active. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so uh, the of the two activities, what are the what are the two activities happening between the object and subject? Appearing, appearing, act of appearing and act of apprehending. Two. Of the two, the object appears to you as objectively real. Yes? Deceptive. It is deceptive or not? Deceptive. On the appearance level, the deception is happening. And then, what do you think? How does your mind react to it? Oh, there's object, there is an object real flower? Or no, it's just my metal input to you. How does how does your mind react to how does mind apprehend the object? Object real or a subject real? Objective real. You 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 it appears object real and your mind also apprehends this to be object real. So which means the mistake is happening on both levels. Which level? On the level of appearance and on the level of apprehending. Both levels there's a mistake happening. Look, this is very important. When you become arahat, when somebody becomes arahat, I want you, I want you to become the supreme arahat, the Buddha, not just arahat, right? So when when somebody becomes arahat, um, a simple arahat, non-Buddha arahat, what happens is that self-grasping ignorance stops. You agree? Hey, yes. what what stops? Good. Self-grasping ignorance stops. Which means you will never grasp, you will never apprehend the object as objectively real. You're getting it? But the object continues to appear as objectively real. Object appear, continues to appear as objectively real, but your mind will never apprehend this as objectively real. So the mistake happens on which level? Appearance, Appearance not the apprehending, not the apprehension. On the apprehension level, there is no mistake happening. So the mistake happening on the apprehension level, particular object of reality, that is self-grasping ignorance, that is afflictive obscurations. Mistake happening on the appearance level, just the appearance level, not the, the apprehending level, that is the stain of the cognitive of obscuration. So this mistake on the appearance of the object as object real, will be removed only when you become a Buddha. So, cognitive obscuration is removed only when you become a Buddha. So, what is that cognitive obscuration? That is the mistake happening on the level of the appearance of the object of existence. Mistake happening, okay, which is more difficult to remove? To, for the, the object, object to appear as object real, the flower to appear as object real, or to apprehend the, the flowers of the real, which is more difficult to be removed? 
appearance, mistaken appearance of the flower to which is real, that is more difficult to be removed. That one which is more difficult to be removed is this carnage of obscuration. That one easier to be removed, what is that? Misperception of the flower as, misapprehending of the flower as object real, that is easier to be removed. That is afflictive obscuration. You're getting it? Okay, so on the, the, if somebody would ask you, what exactly is carnage of obscuration? It's a mental stain which is responsible for you to have the object to appear in a mistaken way, to, which made you to mistakenly appear the object as objectively real. That stain responsible for that, um, the, the, the uh, what appearance, wrong appearance of the object is the cognitive obscuration. You're getting it? Let me say it again. What is cognitive obscuration? Cognitive obscuration is a mental stain, subtle mental stain, which, which, which makes you to have things appear as objectively real. In other words, subtle metal stain, which is responsible for for the for the beings for the objects to appear as objectively real. Subtle stains which are responsible for the objects to appear as objectively real. That is the cognitive obscuration. Huh? You got it? Cognitive obscurations, corner obscuration is the subtle stain of the mind which is responsible for the objects to appear as objectively real to your mind. Say it again. Arhats? Yes. No, the arhats there are two. Yeah. Non Buddha arhats, okay. they have abandoned the afflictive obscurations, they still have the cognitive obscurations. Say that, right? Of course. Arhats as opposed to? No, no, we were trying to define the arahat. Yes. What is arahat? So many of you said that arahats are those people, those beings who remove the afflictive obscurations and who are still left with the conflict obscurations. This is all not the complete arahat, this is a partial arahat, which means the non Buddha arahats. The Buddha is also arahat. So it's not the, it is not an exhaustive meaning of the arahat ship. Yes, over there. Oh, that's a good question. Um, the next level, or it's just that they, at the moment they have not yet been. Okay, this is a good question. Thank you. <sighs> Okay, anybody who likes to help me? Huh? The non Buddha arahats, is it that, you know, they're happy, they're just happy with the having removed the afflictive obscurations and attained the fearlessness and not, not keen to go for the next level, not keen to attain full Buddhahood, full enlightenment, or it's just a process. It's such a process, you keep going and you reach a level whereby you have removed the afflictive obscurations and then you struggle to remove the corner of obscuration. Is it like this or somebody who deliberately stays, stays there, now I'm done, right? I did my high school, I don't want to go to college. Or somebody who's in the process of completing, complete the high school, right? I finished my high school, not yet in college, but I'm just going into the college, right? So it's a process, it's a part of the whole process, or deliberate attempt. Now I finished my high school, I'm done. I don't want to go to college. The wish of the two is that. Huh? Is the process? Both are possible. Very good. Yes. 
Philip. <laughs> what Philip said is true. Say the Bodhisattva. So now, some of those who talked about the Bodhisattvas, like the, say, the uh, Tindubla, talked about the Bodhisattvas. So the Bodhisattvas, it is a, for the, them, it's just a part of the process. When they reach the say they gate, gate, para gate, para sam gate. When there is the, okay, para gate. When there is a para gate, when there is a para gate, so from there, then you talk about the, the uh, para, para gate, the part of seeing. Part of seeing, part of meditation, these to combine together. Okay, these two part of seeing and part of meditation, the third and the fourth path, these two combined together is for the bodhisattvas, divided into ten. These ten are known as the ten bhumis, ten bodhisattva bhumis. When you reach the eighth bhumi, you attain, you become arahat. So it is not that you stop there, it's a process, you still continue. Then nine bumi, ten bumi. After ten bumi, then you become a Buddha, right? So it be, it becomes some arat ship, it, meaning that removing the effect of non Buddha arat that becomes a part of the process. Whereas there's another category, right from the beginning, their goal is just to attain fearlessness, nothing to do with the what infinite happiness or the Buddhahood. I don't want to attain Buddhahood. I want. I just want to be liberated. I just want my personal liberation. That's it. So for them, when they reach the uh, level whereby you re they remove the affective obscurations, then they think of ta taking a rest, sabbatical leave. <laughs> <laughs> they think of taking a leave, right? But they cannot take the sabbatical leave, but the Buddha will wake them up, right? Wake them up and said that, Still, you have not perfected your qualities. You have attained liberation, but you have not attained full perfection. So for that, you need to follow the Bodhisattva path. So for them, they think that they reach the, they reach the goal. They, don't want, they know that there is a Buddhahood which is more, which is better, but they're not eager. So for them, this is also one part, which is non-Buddha Arhats who set that as the, the goal. For the Bodhisattvas, they don't set that as the goal, but they set, set that as a part of the process. Good, thank you, Philip. Okay, we'll stop here. <clears throat> Parasangate bodhiswatyatam Om gate gate Paragate Parasangate bodhiswatyatam Om Gati Gati Paragati Parasangati Bodhiswaha Okay, we'll read the dedication. Page 52. Dedication page 52. <clears throat> I dedicate the merits thus gathered towards the realizers and the deeds and the prayers of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas of the three times, and to the holding of the doctrine, scripture, and insight. May I in all life, through the force of this merit, never separate from the four wheels of the Mahana vehicle and accomplish all the stages of the path, renunciation, bodhicitta, perfume in the two stages. From my two collections, vast space that have immense. From working with effort at this practice for a great length of time, may I become the chief living Buddha for all those whose minds wish my ignorance. <laughs>